Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Gerald Newman. I'm one of the directors of the Human Rights Program. Uh, and we're very pleased that you're all here uh, for what we think will be a very exciting conference over the next day and a half, or half and a day, uh, on the subject of human rights uh, in a time of populism. We actually started thinking about this conference quite a while ago, uh, after first uh, Brexit, uh, then the US election, uh, then watching a series of elections in Europe, some of which might be thought to have turned out better than others, uh, and the rise of populism uh, as a very common issue in the world scene, which has implications for human rights, uh, both in terms of what are the policies that populist governments uh, in power adopt with regard to their own populations, uh, and also the issue of the rise of populism in countries uh, and er regions uh, that have been very supportive of the international human rights system. Uh, I'm thinking particularly in terms of the United States uh, and the European Union. Uh, as supporters of the international human rights system, uh, in which there were now administrations coming into power uh, that may have very different attitudes uh, towards the international human rights system, and what does that mean for the system. So we wanted to think more deeply uh, about the questions uh, of populism and its relationship uh, to human rights. What, what the causes of the rise of populism may be, what the effects uh, may be, both domestically uh, and in foreign policy. Look around the world at some examples uh, in different parts of the world uh, of the phenomenon of populism not thinking that we would find uniform answers to all questions in all the different parts of the world. And then what lessons the human rights system might learn uh, from the rise of populism, uh, and what steps the human rights system uh, should take uh, in order to deal with some new challenges uh, that may be arising uh, as a result of populism. Uh, so that is the program uh, that we're going to be following uh, for the next day and a half. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School, uh, the Institute for Global Law and Policy here at the Law School, uh, the HLS Advocates for Human Rights, the Harvard International Law Journal, and the Harvard Human Rights Journal. And We'd also like to express our appreciation for report, support that we've received uh, from the Asia Center uh, at Harvard University uh, for this conference. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to move uh, to the first panel. And you have programs uh, and biogra fuller biographies uh, of the speakers are in the programs. Uh, we'll try to keep introductions uh, to a minimum, uh, but briefly, if I can introduce the panelists on this uh, panel. Uh, first, immediately to my right is Peter Hall, who is the Krupp Foundation Professor of European Studies in the Department of Government here at Harvard, uh, and the author of numerous books and articles on European politics and comparative political economy. Uh, next, Ruth Okedeji, who is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School uh, and a renowned scholar on international intellectual property law and the role of, international, of intellectual property in social and economic development. Uh, and third, Matthew Stevenson, who is Professor of Law here at HLS, an expert on the application of positive political theory uh, to legal institutions and an international consultant and advisor on anti-corruption. Uh, and with that, let me give the floor to Peter. Thank you. OK, thank you. Let me just see if this, uh, do I, 
Do I point this at, what do I point this at? This? I don't point it at anything, I just click it. All right. Um, well, let me begin by thanking Jerry uh, for including me in this very uh, uh, interesting uh, event. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, as you just heard. Um, I'm a, a scholar of European politics. Uh, and I'm going to speak about the rising sources of support for uh, populist parties uh, in the developed democracies. I think some of what I have to say may travel to the developing world. Uh, some of it may not. Uh, and I hope uh, these very general remarks that I'm going to make are, uh, provide some useful background for the discussions we're going to have more specifically about human rights and, um, and some of the consequences of uh, support for populism. Can you hear me? Is this coming through the... It's fine. Okay. So, and uh, of course, uh, you know, to talk about the sources of rising support for populism in 15 minutes is a little bit like trying to recite the collected works of uh, William Shakespeare in 15 minutes. So. Uh, I can only make a, a few points, and uh, each point I make uh, deserves more uh, elaboration than I can give it, but I'm, my hope is to be a little bit provocative. And I'm going to tr uh, treat three topics. Now the suspense ends and we see if the slides work. So they do. Um, so uh, first of all, what is uh, contemporary populism? Uh, Jerry asked me in particular to make some remarks about that. Uh, why do more and more people uh, vote for populist candidates uh, and parties. Uh, and uh, thirdly, not quite the same question, uh, why now? Uh, what are the macro level developments that inspire uh, rising levels of support for such uh, parties, particularly in the developed democracies? Populism has, of course, uh, been around for a long time, including in uh, this country in various forms and certainly in Latin America. Uh, at one time or other, uh, populism was seen as a Latin American sport. Uh, but it's now uh, a, a transnational phenomenon that I think uh, is of great importance. So uh, how should we define uh, populism? Um, this is a, a highly contestable topic. I'm, not, I'm sure that not everyone in this room will agree with uh, my views, but let me uh, s simply state them. Uh, populism has uh, normative connotations, as we all know, uh, positive for some, uh, negative uh, for others. And uh, each group on uh, either side of that issue wants to define populism uh, somewhat differently. Uh, and maybe they should be welcome to do that, uh, as Humpty Dumpty uh, would have advised. Uh, but the approach that I would take to this uh, is to ask, uh, what is the real world phenomenon uh, of such importance that we need a label for it? Uh, and in my view, for at least uh, the European democracies and this country, uh, this would be uh, radical right-wing candidates who are mounting uh, new kinds of appeals in the contemporary uh, era. And uh, some commentators in the blogosphere, and of course there's a huge uh, set of uh, blogosphere work on this, uh, some of those commentators uh, suggest we should call these uh, right-wing populists uh, fascists in order to preserve a, a, a positive connotation, a more positive connotation for the word uh, populism. Uh, but uh, fascism entails dictatorship, and that's not the case for most of uh, the parties and candidates uh, that I look at. So uh, I would define, um, no, here we, here we go, yeah. So I, I would define populist parties or candidates as ones with a distinctive set of appeals uh, namely, those who claim to speak for a broad people, not all people, but a broad people, a people whose voice is said to have been ignored uh, by uh, the political elite, a political elite that's presented as corrupt uh, or incompetent. And of course, uh, that definition uh, owes a great deal to Jan Werner Muller's uh, study of populism, uh, to Kass Muda, who's uh, looked at it carefully in Europe. And uh, in those terms, populism comes in both uh, left-wing and uh, right-wing variants. Uh, however, in the developed democracies, there's more uh, diversity on the left, uh, where it's uh, much harder to assign uh, what we might call radical left parties uh, to uh, the populist category or non-populist category. Uh, and of course, the right-wing variant is further distinguished uh, by a virulent uh, nationalism. 
uh, which typically presents uh, globalization in its many dimensions uh, as a force to be opposed, uh, and which demonizes a set of outgroups, including most notably uh, immigrants of other races and religions. So uh, note that on this definition, uh, politicians such as Jeremy uh, Corbyn in the UK or Bernie Sanders in this country uh, represent an important phenomenon in their own right, an important political phenomenon in my view certainly, namely radical critics of the inequalities of capitalism, uh, but they're not populists per se, at least according uh, to this definition. Now, um, on this definition, over the past two decades, support for populist candidates has risen significantly uh, in the developed as well as the developing world. And indeed, I think this is one of the most important uh, political phenomena of our time. So uh, where are those votes uh, coming from? Uh, let me begin with, uh, with two caveats. Uh, first, I'm going to emphasize the transnational commonalities in what I think is a global a populist movement. I think there is a transnational populist movement. This is probably the only issue, only one of two issues maybe in with, with which I ag agree with uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, but national variations inevitably uh, feed into this. Um, uh, as Tolstoy uh, might have said, uh, all nations are unhappy, but every nation is unhappy in its own uh, way. Uh, recent flows of immigration in countries such as Germany uh, matter more than they do in some others. Uh, corruption is more of an issue in uh, East Central Europe than it is uh, elsewhere. Uh, votes for Brexit had something to do with English nationalism. So there are elements of national distinctiveness which uh, stand in the way of monolithic uh, generalization. Uh, but the second caveat is this. Where, where populist causes or candidates win elections, uh, as they did in the case of the Brexit referendum, uh, as some would argue they did in the last uh, presidential election here, uh, where they do, uh, they inevitably do so on the back of a broad and multiply motivated uh, coalition. Uh, so as we know, more than 90% of Republicans uh, voted for Donald Trump, uh, and many for reasons that uh, do not explain, for instance, why the French might have voted uh, for Marine Le Pen. So there, I think those are two important uh, caveats. And, and for this reason, I think one of the most interesting dimensions of support for populism in the developed democracies uh, is why it has been so strong among white uh, working class voters, uh, not least because uh, that particular appeal spells political disaster uh, for the traditional uh, center left. And in my view, the uh, ethnographic literature uh, provides crucial clues about why this might be the case. Uh, to take only one well-known example, think of Arlie Hawksmouth's interviews with folks in uh, Louisiana. Uh, I think those interviews reveal something important. Uh, they suggest that many of these people feel left behind in this uh, now familiar phrase. That is to say, uh, socially marginalized, and marginalized in both economic and in cultural terms. So movement from a manufacturing to a service economy, and some would say now to a knowledge economy, have left many people, as we well know, uh, without the kind of secure middle class living that they might have once anticipated. And cultural frameworks that have seen the elite embrace post-materialist values, and I'm thinking of many people in this room, have left other people with more traditional values feeling like uh, strangers in their own land, as Hawkschild uh, argues in her uh, so, uh, with Noam uh, Gidron, I've been doing uh, some research to see if this notion that support turns on feelings of left behind, see if that travels beyond the ethnographic studies uh, in which we see reports of that. Uh, and uh, to do this, we assess whether people feel socially marginalized uh, with a question that asks them about uh, subjective social status namely where they think they sit on an overall social ladder. There's the question on the slide. Uh, and we find uh, in this work two things. Uh, first, white men without a college education feel more marginal to society today than they did uh, 30 to 35 years ago in 11 of the 12 countries for which we can find uh, evidence for this on this measure. So there is some evidence, it's a modest decline, but there's some evidence of a decline uh, 
in this sense of subjective uh, social status, uh, a, a, an indication that over time there are groups of people, particularly uh, white uh, men with less than college education, uh, who feel less uh, central to society. I, I might note, by the way, that um, when we look at women uh, without a college education, uh, their subjective social status has increased dramatically in these countries over time. They feel more central to society, on this measure at least, uh, than they did in uh, the late 1980s. So that's the first thing we find. Second, uh, even when we uh, condition our estimations on a whole bunch of uh, other factors uh, that might affect how a person uh, votes, uh, based on data from 26 European countries in 2012, uh, we find that this sense of social marginalization, this sense that I'm no longer at the center of my society, inclines people to vote uh, either for parties of the populist right uh, or parties of the populist uh, left or radical left, not necessarily populist. So a lot more could be said about this, and I'm happy to say more if there's time. Uh, but let me turn to the uh, third question uh, I want to address, which is, uh, why now? Uh, what kind of developments at the macro level have been leading people toward these populist parties? And of course, we could spend days uh, arguing about this, and there's many kinds of evidence. Um, uh, and of, of this, I can't see my slides very well. Of necessity, uh, my answer to this question is going to be more speculative, um, because it, it, this is actually a very hard uh, issue on which to uh, develop systematic evidence. Uh, it, it, we can think first about what uh, might be called uh, demand-side uh, developments. Uh, by that I mean developments that give rise to the deep political discontent that clearly underpins rising support for populism. And then I'm going to say a few words about uh, what we could call supply-side developments, namely the ways in which uh, public policies and party strategies uh, impinge on uh, this support. Uh, and my remarks are based on a growing body of evidence, uh, but uh, they're going to be um, uh, so brief as to be virtually telegraphic. Oh, thanks. Uh, so long-term economic developments clearly matter. Nothing I'm saying here is going to surprise anybody in this room. In particular, the loss of secure, uh, reasonably well-paid jobs, uh, often, though not always, in manufacturing have left many people without secure jobs or incomes, the kind of incomes on which they could comfortably uh, raise a family. And there's clear evidence that those circumstances, those economic circumstances, are closely related uh, to support for populist parties. Uh, but note that uh, those who are worst off in economic terms tend to gravitate towards parties of the radical left while those who vote for parties or candidates of the populist right tend to be a few rungs up the economic or uh, social ladder, uh, and in some sense, I think, uh, worried about falling uh, farther down that ladder. Uh, and there's some evidence that uh, what bothers uh, these supporters of populism, uh, right populism in particular, uh, the most is not the immediate economic circumstances of their household, uh, but rather a sense that they and their children no longer have the opportunities that they once uh, thought they could uh, expect. And uh, they're not entirely wrong about that. Raj Chetty's data that I've just put up here, many of you will have seen, suggests that uh, the younger cohorts in uh, this country uh, have uh, much lower levels of opportunity uh, than people who were born uh, when I was. Uh, so these people's complaints are uh, not so much about their personal household circumstances as they are about uh, the direction of society as a whole. Uh, for them, uh, something that we could think of as a social contract is unraveling. Now, uh, some think that the relevant economic developments have to do mainly with the uh, outsourcing that uh, is associated with globalization. Uh, my own view is that uh, technological change is more important for the economic insecurity that's uh, central here. Uh, and uh, that's important uh, because while protectionist policies can provide uh, some elements of uh, protection, if you like, uh, against outsourcing, uh, trying to stop technological change uh, is a recipe for reducing general standards of living. 
So it matters what the sources of this are. Um, but lest we think that populism uh, is simply an unfortunate and inexorable byproduct of economic progress, uh, we should note, and I would certainly argue, that many people's lives have been made worse by the neoliberal policies pursued by Western governments and uh, some non-Western governments uh, in the past 30 years. So if the root cause of discontent uh, lies in the disappearance of what I would call uh, decent jobs, and I think it does, uh, we should remember that public policies can make existing jobs more or less decent with uh, minimum wage laws, with uh, measures that uh, uh, facilitate or impede uh, the organizing of trade unions, uh, with uh, regulations that impose certain obligations on uh, firms or um, uh, those who employ uh, workers. So I think Western governments are reaping the fruits of what uh, they have sown. And of course, cultural developments also matter here, and much could be said about that, but I'm going to allude to them uh, only briefly in the context of developments on the supply side of the economy. So for 40 years after the Second World War, partisan competition in most Western democracies took place along a familiar left-right axis of the sort I portrayed uh, in this diagram, in which uh, support for state intervention and uh, redistribution was central to the left side and uh, opposition to that was central to the right side of this spectrum. Uh, I think as we all know, beginning in the uh, 1980s, this um, a traditional left-right cleavage was cross-cut by a second cleavage, often called a values cleavage, that separates people with uh, post-materialist or cosmopolitan values uh, from uh, people with more uh, traditional values associated with conservative religious ideas, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments, ethnic views of the nation, uh, and the like. And in that context, over the course of the 1980s and 90s, electoral competition in uh, Europe, and I think in this country too, began to take place along the diagonal of this diagram, because uh, center-left parties uh, moved uh, to support cosmopolitan values, uh, and on the other end, uh, that dimension is uh, anchored by uh, radical right parties espousing uh, traditional values, but also laissez-faire economic policies, uh, an important uh, point. Uh, and you'll have noticed something interesting about this diagram. Uh, namely, there are parties in all in three of these four quadrants, uh, although only a few in the upper right quadrant, but there are no political parties in the lower left quadrant. And there are a lot of people uh, in that lower left quadrant, namely people who want to see some kind of economic protection but have relatively traditional and sometimes anti-immigrant uh, views on uh, values issues. Uh, so over the last decade or so, what's happened is that these radical right parties, uh, which have always been uh, traditional, uh, not to say authoritarian, in their uh, uh, positions on values issues, have moved away from their laissez-faire positions, uh, their uh, uh, low-tax, small-state positions on economic issues, and begun to argue for uh, more redistribution, more kinds of social protection. Sometimes it's trade protection instead of more social benefits, but it's nonetheless a clear uh, message. And of course, uh, you can see uh, what's uh, happened. Uh, and I think that that is true also in this country, although I don't have time uh, to say uh, much more about it. I'm going to close very quickly here. So this has had two effects. Um, first, oh, well, the other, I suppose the other the development that I want to emphasize here is that over the same period of time, over the past 30 years, there's been a convergence in the economic platforms of the center left and the center right. To many people, the center left and the center right look like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And I would argue that on economic issues, that's true even in the US, where nonetheless polarization is so widely uh, a feature of our uh, political system. And that's had two effects. First, it means that uh, many people uh, wonder whether anybody speaks for them, whether the parties are indeed simply uh, Tweedledum and twe Tweedledee. And secondly, it means that the mainstream parties, which have been so similar on economic issues, have, uh, in an effort to distinguish themselves from one another, shifted to emphasize values issues. And that's what this slide uh, indicates. And of course, by emphasizing 
political comp by centering political competition around values issues, uh, those parties have played right into the hands of the populist right, uh, which wins votes primarily on values issues. So in fact, I think we're facing uh, something like a perfect economic and social storm uh, with serious consequences for uh, the Western democracies as well as uh, the developing world, and I look forward to hearing more about that from the other panelists. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, and um, thank you to everyone who's here. I want to focus my remarks um, building somewhat on themes that Peter has already articulated, but locating them in particular um, in the sub-Saharan African space. Um, I find the subject both deeply perplexing um, and somewhat uncomfortable when thinking about sub-Saharan Africa, in large part because values politics is not something that has been characteristic in most sub-Saharan African countries. Now, one might say this is because democracies are still young and fledgling, um, largely unstable. Um, one might think that um, the real issues tend to be principally economic and therefore um, democratic values have not been deeply entrenched. Um, and one might think that, in fact, what's going on in most of sub-Saharan Africa is the question of how to integrate their economies more significantly and materially into the global economic order. Um, I think all of those observations are correct, but I think they also mask something that is much more fundamental and that has in my view, um, something that's squarely uh, laid at the feet of um, international human rights, um, and in particular, the reporting and the credibility mm -hmm. mechanisms that are associated um, with norm setting in the international human rights corpus. Um, in my comments, my written comments, I highlight the fact that international human rights law has long had um, an Africa problem. Um, that Africa problem is one that is both um, a problem of legitimacy, uh, the extent to which African leaderships in the post-colonial state viewed international human rights both as a source of um, um, leverage um, for its anti-colonial uh, struggle, um, but it was also deeply resistant to the international human rights uh, framework, in part because it was uh, presented as a neutral set of values that had universal appeal. Um, and while it was politically expedient for many countries to embrace uh, the Universal Declaration, and certainly in the heyday of uh, post-colonial statehood, um, it was accompanied uh, quite sharply by deep discontent um, and by deep um, resistance in some quarters of the United Nations system. And so I start off first by putting on, on the ground what I think is really going on um, in the sub-Saharan African space, where one might on the surface say that there have been significant democratic wins um, in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we've seen Nigeria, for example, um, now pass uh, democratic governments uh, twice with re relatively peaceful elections. We've seen Namibia um, engage actually in e-voting for the first time. Again, very stable uh, transition. Um, and then there's Kenya, and I, and I put this uh, picture of the famous handshake for those of you who've been following uh, what's been happening um, in Kenyan politics. Um, and I start here with what I think is part of the consequences of what's happening in Western liberal democracies and the spillover effects, or at least the reaction um, and perhaps mask effects of what's happening in the sub-Saharan African uh, continent. So Kenya, um, again, joining the list of countries where democratic elections ostensibly have been free, fair, um, um, and have been stable, most importantly. Um, as you know, dubbed uh, Raila uh, uh, the people's president, the, the idea being that corruption is what produced um, the presidential results that uh, um, brought uh, the re-election of the old president. Um, and there was, of course, deep chasm uh, protests, efforts by uh, the people's president to ensure that the legitimacy of the democratic process remained in challenge. Uh, for the first time on the continent, um, a judiciary ruled that there had to be um, a revote um, of the presidential elections, and of course, uh, the same outcome occurred. Um, uh, Raila continued to, contest, to contest, uh, the outcome of the elections, generating sufficient 
angst and division by appealing in many ways uh, to what are, I would say, some populist tendencies. The idea that it is us versus them, I belong to the people, this is an educated elite that depends on um, technocratic expertise um, in making judgments, and of course uh, the economic conditions across the continent um, and in Kenya as well continue to reveal deepening economic divide uh, between the haves and the have-nots. Um, and so the people's president continued to generate uh, significant credibility, significant appeal, um, destabilizing what one would otherwise call a fairly uh, fair and transparent, at least certainly by sub-Saharan African standards, um, election outcome. Kenyans went to sleep um, some uh, one night and woke up the next, and there was oh, the... Um, Actually, this is poignant because we're not sure how long the handshake will last, so <laughs> it's completely fine. Um, but went to bed one morning um, in, a, in a society that was deeply divided in which people who were in favor of the opposition really felt that they had a voice that represented who they were, their everyday struggles. These were the ordinary people who had been left behind by the political elite and whose interests and whose priorities were marginalized and sidelined in national politics. Um, and there was also the sense that there was a legacy um, a leadership um, that from father to son um, with a ruling class essentially that had crystallized over the years of independence um, and that there was no way for the average person or ordinary politicians in fact to begin to represent the people in what was essentially an iron cage um, of politics. And so the people of Kenya went to bed one night, woke up the next morning and here uh, was the famous handshake um, that has reverberated around the continent and in, in, in some ways around the world um, leaving uh, the people's president essentially in some kind of detente with the ruling class. Um, what that handshake means, I will reflect on um, as I go through the talk. My sense is that the sense, the form of populism, this deep dissatisfaction arising from political or economic insecurity um, is a strange thing to associate with populism or quasi-populism in the African context because economic insecurity has been the status quo uh, since the post-colonial state um, emerged. I will say, however, that there is something different about the sense of economic anxiety um, that has tinged the political class and that has stirred um, what we would historically have simply referred to as tribal interests. Now, there are lots of things that um, Africa cannot teach um, Western developed mature democracies, but the one thing Africa can teach is tribalism. Um, <laughs> Tribalism has long characterized the political process, and it is very much shaped around the sense of us versus them, the sense of superiority, be it on racial grounds, be it on caste grounds, um, be it simply as a result of the colonial state and the way in which power was allocated amongst different ethnic groups. Um, but one thing about tribalism is it, it's always been a zero-sum game. It has never been about pluralistic politics. And certainly in the 1960s and the 1970s, there was an effort to try to transform tribal politics into some form of a pluralistic um, democratic um, process in which representative voice and representative vote would carry the day over and above um, um, tribal um, affiliations and tribal tendencies. That has not been successful in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, within the um, ostensible political process, um, tribalism goes and runs quite deeply in the way in which power is shared, in the way in which power is transferred, and in the kinds of political institutions that in essence make it very difficult for claims about human rights violations in the process to become the focal point of um, international human rights um, um, institutions. So one of the challenges, of course, is that when you have an appeal to the kind of deep dissatisfaction arising from political or economic isolation and insecurity, um, that becomes amplified when you can tie or connect that dissatisfaction with the ruling elite's allegiance to neoliberalism. And that is, of course, been the situation in most of the, um, of the African economies in which we have seen stable transitions of power, but we've seen the emergence of opposition forces, opposition um, figures who have become heroes in the minds of the average person or in the, uh, in, in the minds of um, a significant population um, to 
demand access to political um, governance and to demand access in particular to the kinds of rights, economic and social and cultural, that have long eluded um, the average um, African uh, citizen of, uh, of an African country. I think the populism of this kind of historic, uh, tribalistic kind of exclusionary force has long impeded the development of what I would call a thick corpus of human rights, um, governing and shaping and defining the way in which um, the African post-colonial state has engaged in democratic um, um, governance. In fact, the emphasis, of course, in the international human rights field on political rights, even in the face of significant economic and developmental um, challenges um, has not helped. In fact, it has enhanced the sense that what is needed is not liberal policies and is not democratic institutions, but instead the kind of leader that is going to simply declare um, the rights and the interests of his or her political tribe, um, and in this case, literal, his or her linguistic and sociological tribe, um, and to elevate that above adherence or allegiance to, to pluralism or to international um, engagement. Put simply, I think that there's room for the argument that when you look at the way in which African leaders, especially those who are brought before the International Criminal Court, for example, appeal to these populist tendencies, the argument has always been that I have kept us immune as a country or as a people from these foreigners. We have not in the immigrant sense, but in the sense of foreign agents, in the sense of foreign expertise, international um, institutions who have been part of the norm-setting process um, that has sought to elevate democratic process uh, perhaps over and above, and as I make an argument, uh, to the detriment um, of what I think is real, fully grounded and fully matured opportunities for democracy to evolve in the pluralistic sense. So there is room, I think, um, for the international human rights system um, to be charged in some way as being an ally of these failed neoliberal policies um, that have characterized the kinds of intrusive um, recommendations by the IMF or the World Bank or the international institutions um, that have left millions and millions of average Africans um, in squalor and in deep poverty. Now, one of the things that, that African um, states try to do um, in this tension between the use of international human rights instruments to advance independence and sovereignty, and at the same time to resist the sense of the other and of the foreign and of the expert coming in to shape cultural and normative identity um, was to develop a distinct and culturally relevant or regionally distinctive um, African Charter of Human Rights. Um, the African Charter of Human Rights has been critiqued and celebrated for lots of different reasons, but what I want to identify is one consistent critique has been the clawbacks, right? The idea that African states were limited in many ways or could be limited in many ways to simply recognizing and protecting human rights up to the degree that national law allowed that too. Now, in systems where tribalism reigns um, and in systems where de facto and de jure discrimination against members of other minority groups or ethnic groups was concretized by economic policies that allowed those who did not have access to be further distant, a distance from um, the means of economic pro progress nationally, only served, I think, to concretize the resentment um, that average populations faced um, when talking about the promises that human rights and the aspirations of the human rights regimes. These clawbacks, and if you think about the ways in which um, Mugabe's Zimbabwe or Gambia's Jame were in fact used to justify either throwing out the white farmers or Jame in, in particular elevating only members of his, of his own ethnic group in all of the elite positions, really became a source of um, division in a way that made people distrust the political process and made them more willing to embrace these kinds of economic nationalist, tribalist sentiments that had become a part um, of the um, political process. Now, the problem, of course, is that the excesses of the elite political class were not captured by human rights monitoring or by human rights enforcement. Why? Because the emphasis on political rights tended to elevate processes and institutions above the material choices that governments were making that were systematically disenfranchising and marginalizing large areas of the populace. 
if you look at the annual human rights reports, starting from the U.S. Department of State uh, to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, um, all of these have been, for the last 25, 30 years, been singularly preoccupied with political processes and political institutions without recognizing the quite embedded tribal um, and non-pluralistic and largely um, um, alienating tendencies that these policies were creating and fomenting the interest in what I would call um, a quasi-populist appeal to reject um, anything that looked um, to be consistent with a neoliberal uh, uh, um, order. At least in the sub-Saharan African context, I think building human rights initiatives and priorities um, around political rights tends to ignore the structural conditions that are a prerequisite to the exercise of personal liberty. And I think there are three countries that illustrate this quite powerfully um, and that have been problematic um, from a human rights perspective in thinking about how to address the lack of interest and the lack of monitoring on economic and political, on economic and social rights and this emphasis on political rights. So Zimbabwe, I've already mentioned, most of you are familiar with what has happened in, in, in Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe, but what most reports have not picked up on um, in the transition and the recent transition in the ouster of Robert Mugabe is, of course, that power was transitioned not necessarily in, um, in consistency with um, um, a real full-fledged robust democratic process, but rather in reaction to um, Mugabe's own preference um, for handing power over to someone that had already been self-selected. So had there not be the intense, the intense um, entrenchment of a ruling elite um, there may have been no one for Mugabe to hand power over to. The fact that someone existed that was willing to accept that power and that the people recognized as an inevitable heir to Mugabe's non-democratic rulership um, is in itself an ironic testament to the way in which process and institutions have been elevated over the substance of whether or not democratic inclusion and pluralistic policies are allowed to flourish within the continent. South Africa, of course, the same thing. Angola, in fact, the same thing. It suggests that law, in particular human rights law, and economic inequality have long coexisted in the sub-Saharan African continent, and that the democratic processes that would have constrained the kind of um, um, unlimited power grabs and the way in which economic policies have really ma marginalized large groups of people on principally um, ethnic grounds have been ignored in the emphasis in the human rights uh, realm in focusing on reporting on political rights. One final point that I want to close up, and that is the way in which human rights organizations have shaped the human rights debate in sub-Saharan African countries so that even domestic non-governmental organizations and human rights organizations have felt an inability to articulate the cause um, of the deep decay of pluralistic politics and the way in which tribalistic politics have become the status quo. Um, and that is because there has been no capacity in many ways to report on the economic and the financial and the corruption that tends to accompany many of these populist uh, campaigns. So I guess I would wrap up by saying in terms of some observations, my own sense is that the human rights regimes um, really need to begin to think more closely and there needs to be some reflection um, on how group and economic, social and cultural rights might assume a more significant role, at least in the shaping of the global human rights agenda, uh, to translate those rights um, not only on paper but into meaningful institutions that allow a check and balance on the kinds of policies that have produced the deep political and economic insecurities and dissatisfaction and illegitimacy that many on the African uh, continent perceive of the normal, average, what we would call democratic processes that elect leaders, leaders but leave people in a deep state of poverty. Uh, great, thanks so much. So I think in many ways what I have uh, to say today is going to be a little bit narrower, but I think very closely related. So I'm uh, not by any means an expert in human rights. I, I generally like them and think there should be more of them, but, but the main reason uh, that, that I'm here is that my principal research focus these days is on corruption and anti-corruption. And uh, Jerry and the other conference organizers had a sense, which I share, that corruption is a big part of the story 
with respect to the rise of these populist leaders. And so uh, in this opening session, I wanted to try to maybe lay the groundwork for a little bit more discussion of how that issue factors into this other constellation of issues by raising a couple of questions about this relationship uh, between corruption and the rise of populism, and then maybe a little bit more indirectly the human rights issues that are going to be the central focus of the discussion. The first of these questions is, uh, and you can think of this as kind of a broad actually set of questions, but I'd, I'd summarize it by, by framing it this way. In what ways might corruption or the public or rhetorical response to corruption uh, contribute to the rise of populism, particularly the more authoritarian or quasi-authoritarian versions of populism? I think that, um, as many of us are likely aware, many, not all, but many populist leaders, left and right wing populists, but I'm focusing more on the right wing populists, have deployed the rhetoric of anti-corruption as a significant uh, feature of their campaigns. And many people have attributed the emphasis on that issue, attributed to the emphasis on that issue, at least part of the appeal of these uh, populist movements. So for those of us in the United States, Donald Trump's Drain the Swamp campaign slogan is probably the most familiar. But uh, folks like Viktor Orban in Hungary and Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and uh, numerous others have talked very explicitly about corruption, and both, both Peter and Ruth referenced this in their presentations, the idea that the existing elite or the existing government is corrupt, and that one of the reasons to give power to these populist leaders or movements is a sense that the uh, existing political elites are so thoroughly corrupt or have so failed to solve these deep-rooted corruption problems that the populist alternative starts to seem more appealing. While we don't have really good, rigorous evidence testing the hypothesis that corruption contributes to the rise of populism, there is pretty good evidence uh, that's suggestive of the validity of that hypothesis. There is good evidence, for example, that in those countries with higher levels of corruption or perceived corruption, when you do surveys, uh, related to, though not the same as the kind that Peter was talking about in his work, uh, trust in government is lower. Uh, belief that democracy is the right system of government is lower, willingness to entertain more radical alternatives to the status quo is higher, and so on and so forth. So that may be one direct mechanism through which corruption, especially unchecked systemic corruption, can lay the groundwork for a populist party uh, or leader or movement to make headway. Uh, another maybe indirect channel through which corruption or failure to check systemic corruption might contribute to the rise of uh, populism is the idea, again, for which we have decent, though certainly not conclusive evidence, that systemic corruption contributes to a bunch of the other problems that Ruth and Peter have talked about that are often thought to be uh, contributors to the rise of populism. So uh, economic inequality for example, seems to have, broadly speaking in the data, a correlation with corruption. The frequency of macroeconomic crises seems to be associated with widespread corruption. Uh, people feeling like they don't have adequate access to health care or education or that their jobs are insecure or that the only people who can get good, stable jobs are those who are well-connected or pay bribes uh, are the sorts of things that might contribute to the appeal of populist leaders. So for this reason, uh, there is, I think, a plausible hypothesis that failing to address systemic entrenched corruption in a society may lay the groundwork for the rise of these kinds of populist leaders or movements. I'm certainly sympathetic to that hypothesis. I think, in, broadly speaking, it's probably true at least some of the time. But I do want to raise a few uh, qualifications or caveats about that idea, that there's this kind of causal arrow leading from unchecked corruption uh, to the rise of populism, especially uh, what you might think of as, as right-wing or quasi-authoritarian populism. Uh, the first point is something I'll return to in a moment because it's going to be related to the second kind of question I want to pursue, but I'll raise it here and, and, and bracket it. And that's that we need 
to be careful not to assume too quickly that when populist leaders or movements rail against the corruption of the elite or say they're going to drain the swamp and, and, and deal with a society's corruption problem, they mean by corruption what people like me who study this in an academic sense mean by corruption. Uh, I think, you know, when in, I was listening to Peter's presentation when he was talking about how populist parties, especially in Western Europe and the United States, are railing against the corruption of the elites. It's not clear that they mean bribery and embezzlement and, uh, and, and, and things of that sort. There's a, a different, broader sense of corruption. So I think that we need to be careful um, to be sensitive to the fact that the word corruption means many different things in many different contexts. Um, and the appeal of a kind of drain the swamp slogan might not actually be because people are worried that, that bribery and nepotism and embezzlement are extensive. That might be a kind of political code word for a different sense of corruption. Second thing, um, and the important caveat, is that while I think there's a plausible case to be made that failure to really deal with and root out systemic corruption, especially in some of the developing countries of the sort that Ruth was emphasizing more in her presentation, may contribute to the rise of these dangerous populist movements, there's a concern that under some circumstances, aggressive anti-corruption efforts um, may themselves lay the groundwork for the rise of insurgent populist parties. And this can occur in a couple of ways that are distinct but, but nonetheless related. The first is that the exposure of widespread corruption through media investigations or prosecutions can under some circumstances uh, end up discrediting the political establishment across the board. Right. So these investigations, we think they're good, they're exposing corruption, but under certain circumstances, actually it makes people even more cynical about the existing political class. It makes them even more open to the idea that some kind of outsider with no political background or, or history is the way to go. Um, the second uh, thing that can sometimes happen is that at least in extreme cases, anti-corruption investigations and prosecutions have caused the in collapse, the entire collapse of major political parties, sometimes multiple political parties, leaving a power vacuum into which charismatic figures can uh, enter. So I think Italy in the 1990s is probably the lead example of this sort of thing happening, where the so-called uh, Tangentopoli or, or Clean Hands investigation uh, did a couple of things. One is it caused essentially the collapse in Italy of the center left and the center right, because you know, they had been governing Italy since basically the end of the Second World War, particularly the center right, and the exposure of corruption in those parties was so widespread, the parties basically ceased to exist, um, which, and it also substantially increased the cynicism of many Italian voters about uh, the political class generally. And I'm not an expert in Italy, but I've spoken to people who are, and there's the argument that this is one of the things that opened the field for someone like Berlusconi. Right, because the traditional parties were gone, he was perceived as an incredibly successful businessman, very charismatic, uh, and ran very much as, I'm an outsider who's different. Now, of course, I'll get to this more a little bit moment, Ber Berlusconi himself was not exactly a paragon of integrity, but there was something about the way in which this root and branch uh, demolition of the traditional political parties through an anti-corruption investigation created a, a, a dangerous power vacuum. Um, Brazil, actually, right now is the country where I'm most worried about this replicating. The parallels, I think, again, as an outsider to both countries, between the so-called uh, Yava Jato or, or car wash investigation in Brazil and the clean hands investigation in Italy are eerie uh, in many ways. And there is a concern, at least I have, that this, I think in many ways, really uh, much needed and to some degree heroic uh, effort that Brazilian prosecutors and judges are undertaking to root out corruption in Brazil could, if the right steps are not taken, create the kind of openings for a Berlusconi-like figure or worse. And I gather we're already seeing evidence that this is happening. Right? Uh, so that's, that's, I think, an important qualification or caveat to the idea that if you only root out corruption, then of course you'll dampen the appeal of uh, populists. Second, uh, another consideration that I want to put on the table, it's a little bit different, but, but I feel like it's, it's worth raising, especially consider when you consider uh, countries like the ones Peter was focusing on a bit more than the ones Ruth was focusing on. And it has to do less with the actual legal or policy response to traditional corruption than the language or rhetoric that people, including people like people in this room, the civil society community, academics, journalists, commentators, and others, use to describe the failings 
of a political system, whether it's the excessive influence of special interest groups and money in politics or various other kinds of systematic unfairness. Um, and let me lay out the question I want to raise by articulating two hypotheses about the 2016 election and surrounding events. And, and they go like this. Hypothesis number one is that the United States is at the very least a plutocracy, if not a kleptocracy. Uh, it's fair to characterize its institutions as those uh, that are systemically corrupt in a variety of ways, not through illegal corruption necessarily like bribery or embezzlement, but through all sorts of ways that those who are wealthy or powerful or otherwise are able to manipulate the system for their own ends. But, the argument continues, the traditional mainstream parties were reluctant to use the language of corruption to describe the failings of the US political system. And this created the space on the left for candidates like Bernie Sanders and on the right for candidates like Donald Trump to seize that terrain, to use that rhetoric that would resonate with many American voters to call, to call the system corrupt. On this view, the great failing of the elite, the establishment, the mainstream, whatever you want to call it, was the reluctance to use the rhetoric of corruption to describe the systemic failings of the US political system. So this is an argument articulated by our law school colleague, Larry Lessig. It's been advanced by uh, the former journalist, now writer and researcher, Sarah Chase, uh, that have made that argument quite explicitly. And it is certainly a plausible argument. The alternative argument, though, is that this position, though I'll call the lessig Chase position, has it exactly backwards. And that the real problem was the overuse of scorched earth rhetoric to describe the very real and genuine failings of the US political system in ways that inadvertently uh, managed to discredit that establishment conventional way of doing things. So the tendency to describe every policy failure as the result of a shadowy cabal of special interests, the Tweedledum, Tweedledee language, I think I'd actually take issue here with, with uh, Peter's point that the two major parties in the US and Western Europe really are on economic policy basically the same. But that idea that there's no difference between the two major parties because they're all neoliberals that have been captured by corporations, uh, the idea that um, just the kind of what I, I think of as the sort of fashionable cynicism of, ah, they're all a bunch of crooks and liars and corrupt. This is, this is the argument that it wasn't the underuse of the rhetoric of corruption to describe the failings of the system that opened the door for politicians like Trump. It was the overuse of that rhetoric and the delegitimization of the kind of boring, dull, unsexy kind of politics that it's about incrementalism and coalition building and differences in policy agendas and so forth that made it seem much more appealing to have someone who's going to come in and blow the whole system up. So I'll close this part of my talk, and I don't have that much time left. I do have one more question I want to address. But the underlying dilemma, as I see it, is corruption itself can undermine the legitimacy of the political establishment, thereby opening the door to an insurgent populist. But at the same time, attempts to attack corruption, whether it's through actual prosecutions or through the use of strong rhetoric to describe the existing system, can also, under some circumstances, discredit the establishment and open the door to insurgent populists. And I think a challenge is figuring out how to navigate that dilemma. Uh, the second question, for which I realize I have less time, but I'll try to get it across quickly, uh, it has to do less with the rise of populism and what, what happens once the populist movement or leader gets into power. Uh, I don't think it would be a terribly surprising observation to anyone in this room that many of these populist leaders, whether or not they ran on a drain the swamp kind of platform, are not exactly paragons of integrity. Right? Whether you're talking about Berlusconi in Italy, or Orban in Hungary, or Thaksin in Thailand, or the Kirchners in Argentina, or Donald Trump in the United States, very often you see these people engaged in really substantial uh, corruption of their own, which uh, raises a puzzle. Why doesn't this behavior alienate the supporters of the populist movement more? If what they're, what they're really upset about, as, as to, this is a point that Peter alluded to, is the idea that a well-connected, entrenched elite is unfairly benefiting uh, you know, without exhibiting the virtues of, of hard work and so forth, and the system is rigged, 
why isn't you know, the Kirchners or Toxin or, or Trump benefiting their families and their cronies the, the ultimate expression of that corruption that the populists are allegedly really upset about? Um, and also, you see in opinion polls over and over again, people say they really don't like corruption. It's really bad. So what's going on? If, if at least part of the appeal of the populists is the opposition to this kind of corruption, once they win office and we see this behavior, why don't they seem to lose that much support, at least in the short to medium term? And I don't know the answer, um, but let me throw out a few uh, hypotheses. And again, countries may vary, as, as Peter and Ruth both emphasize. So I'm, I'm not, no pretense of anything universal, but a few possibilities. Um, one uh, is that, well, maybe, uh, and this is the point that I alluded to before, the rhetoric of, of corruption or anti-corruption wasn't really what the populists were appealing to. They weren't appealing to uh, worry about corruption in the conventional form. Corruption was being used as a kind of code word for um, you know, effete cosmopolitan snobs and Jews and immigrants taking your jobs or depriving you of the, the, your rightful place in society or the social status to which uh, you think you are entitled. It didn't really have to do with giving contracts to friends and hiring relatives or taking bribes. Um, I think that's certainly possible. Um, I think another possibility uh, is that even though voters don't like corruption, they, many voters, including the ones to whom the populists appeal most strongly, if there's one thing they like, they dislike more than corruption, uh, it's moralistic scolds. Uh, and I think one of the things we sometimes see in these cases, again, Italy is, I think, a useful example here, but there are others as well, um, when elites like us go on and on about the corruption of this leader, it is sometimes perceived as holier-than-thou, self-righteous, moralistic scolding which people resent. And they might resent it as well if they themselves have occasionally bent or broken the rules. They might experience these attacks on the leader for the leader's lack of integrity as attacks on them from a group of people who often they perceive as, as don't even have the standing to raise those kinds of concerns. So again, in, in Italy, uh, the attacks of the Italian left, the Communist Party for, in particular on Berlusconi, were often greeted as sanctimonious and hypocritical. Um, some have taken this one step further and suggested that one of the tricks that at least some of these, pol the, these uh, populist leaders managed to pull off is what you might term, for lack of a better, uh, lack of better words, the politics of absolution. That is, in societies where corruption is pervasive, and a lot of people have done stuff that's like technically against the rules, what the more skillful these populist leaders manage to do is establish a kind of implicit mutual forgiveness to tell the people, "You guys are great. You know, everyone is always telling you you're bad, that our society is terrible, but but you guys are great, and just do what you want to do." And you know, the implicit bargain is I forgive you and you forgive me, right? You steal a little bit, I steal a lot, but we're kind of on the same team. Maybe related to that, too, is that even though people say they don't like corruption, they might in some perverse way admire the charismatic populist leader who seems to be living the kind of life that they wish they could lead if only they could. Again, to come back to Italy, a lot there's apparently a lot of evidence that Italian voters uh, thought that a lot of what Berlusconi did and a lot of the way he behaved, including all of his mistresses, was at least to Italian men considered like, wow, he's living the dream. And apparently Trump has a similar appeal with many Americans, and it relates to the earlier point that sometimes the more one criticizes the vulgarity and the lack of integrity and so on and so forth, the, it, it can end up leading to this dynamic where people who actually identify with that person experience these attacks as attacks on them, saying that they're bad people too. And it does seem to be, though, this strange paradox, and I don't have the answer, but I, I hope it will be part of our conversation going forward, where voters generally and, vote, and supporters of populist movements in particular will tell you that they care deeply about corruption, that one of the real reasons they're drawn to these outsiders is the feeling that they have to do something to clean up the systemic corruption of the system, but they don't seem to be bothered by what seems like pretty clear and convincing evidence of drastic corruption by these leaders themselves. And it's a real puzzle about how these shysters are able to pull it off. And I hope we can uh, maybe make some progress in figuring out why that is. Thank you.
our panelists have given us a lot to think about. Uh, and now I would like to include the people in the discussion. Uh, can I ask, uh, are there people on the floor uh, who'd like to speak? Uh, I'd like to remind you that this event is being recorded, uh, so don't speak if you don't wish to be recorded. Uh, if you, could I please ask you uh, to ask an actual question uh, and uh, to keep your, uh, your remarks within uh, a certain brevity uh, and to identify yourself uh, when you take the floor. Or I'll identify you. Richard Haydarian. Yeah, research from the Philippines. So, I want to just build on Matthew's point on the issue of once you open the anti-corruption uh, kind of campaign, that actually could open up the insurgency. And I think that perfectly happened in the case of the Philippines with the Aquinas opening up the investigation and in the process discrediting the whole system. But looking at the populist art of governance with Duterte already in position of power, I think the other thing we have to look at is the fact that how they can effectively deploy conspiracy theory to say that whenever you expose corruption within the populist administration, they'll say that this is just a conspiracy of the Armstrong regime uh, to bring us down. And the other way of also people justifying this is saying, well, they're under siege, so they have to bribe other people in order to protect their projects. So I, I thought maybe that's another aspect that we could look at, and I think it's relevant to Italy and other countries too. Well, I was just gonna say something about that, and this is really Matthew's point, but I, I think that's really important um, but that goes back to the point about legitimacy. Right? By the time you see populist insurgents come up, there's already the scorched earth tactics. Over the course of time, there has been this gradual erosion of faith and trust um, fueled by economic in inequality, fueled by a sense of isolation, as, as Peter mentioned, fueled by all sorts of different things. And, and this is the essence, really, of tribalism. It's the idea that if we don't save ourselves, nobody will save us. Right. Um, and so once you lose legitimacy, it doesn't matter how much you expose corruption, because the answer will be you're just trying to get rid of someone who's going to take care of our interests, um, and therefore we don't believe you, reinforcing, as Matthew says, um, um, the power and, in fact, the credibility of the, of the populist regime. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. The, the phenomenon you point out happens all the time. I mean... Ruth probably could have talked about this much greater length because several of the specific examples that she used in her presentation also discussed in her paper fit this perfectly. Robert Mugabe was like the, the maestro of the conspiracy theory. Everything was being engineered by the CIA. Uh, Jacob Zuma in South Africa, though complicated to situate as the same kind of populist yeah. leader, also every time corruption was exposed, was like this is all a CIA plot, right? That was, that was his line. So a couple things about that. One is that um, maybe slightly more encouragingly, I was speaking to an expert in South African politics at a conference not too different from this one back in the fall, who suggested, at least the Zuma example suggests that over time this stops working, uh, that it worked really well the first couple times that Zuma deployed it, and then after a while, and you know, eventually he was forced to resign, it, it, it started losing its traction. The second thing, and I think this, is, this relates very much to your point and some of the larger discussion, you know, there is no Archimedean neutral point in politics. But at the same time, in certain polities, it seems like there are some institutions, whether formal or informal, that are more trusted, uh, or at least a cluster of them are trusted to give some version of the truth. So in South Africa, the Office of the Public Protector, at least when Tulip Madinsela was running it, kind of had that credibility and was a counterweight to Zuma, even though she didn't have that much in the way of institutional uh, power. Uh, still, I think she had enough credibility, one of the concerns is that when you lose those independent voices, precisely the phenomenon you describe can, can take place. And I think this is to your point, the populists will try to undermine and discredit those potential. So everything is fake news, right? And again, in this country, we go for 30 years where people generally, but particularly one political faction, has been talking about media bias over and over and over again to the point where people might more, be more receptive now to the claim that you know anything you hear that's negative about your guy uh, is actually the product of fake news or a conspiracy or propaganda. Um, I think you actually see this in, in Israel right now, 
where, again, Netanyahu, not a populist necessarily of the sort that we're talking about, but he and his supporters are very clearly trying to do things to discredit the police, which in Israel has traditionally been a very independent institution, more, more independent, independent from the attorney general and the cabinet, uh, and to make various legal and other changes to discredit the significance of the police recommendations that Netanyahu and his associates be indicted, right? So I think the point, I'm really glad you raised the point because I think this is critical, and it actually goes to one of the issues I read. Why don't people care about corruption? Well, if they don't believe that it exists or everything is a plot, then it's not going to have the same kind of impact. Peter, can I ask, do you want to respond uh, to what's just uh, been said or not yet. to uh, any, <laughs> what, any of what uh, Ruth and Matthew have said? No. Or, or no. later? No, other than to say it's been very interesting so far. <laughs> Note the qualifier. So far. <laughs> Uh, in the back, I can't quite see you. Thank you so much. Excellent presentations, all of you. And um, I'm just curious to know the role of these disenfranchised groups. Uh, you know, you're talking about the Palestinians in Israel. You're talking about blacks, Latinos in here, and the concept of building the wall to keep them away. And how does that play out? Uh, it seems like we're going, instead of corruption, it seems like you're getting more traction by really isolating these groups and really throwing the weight of the state, so to speak, or the weight of the power against this group to get the populace involved in the process and, and, and getting, getting to rally on your behalf. And I wonder, and I, you see that, you know, obviously, in, in Germany, now here, is really very strong. And I wonder how you, in the formulas, we, like, you know, you're involved, you know, corruption and a lot of other factors, these groups have to do with raising the spectrum of this populist figure coming up. Okay, there is something, there is something I can speak to. Um, so I quite agree with you. I think that um, uh, while um, Matt has made a totally convincing case that issues of corruption are important here, it's certainly in the uh, European countries I look at, and, and I would have said in this country too, uh, it's the ethno-nationalist character of the appeal that is in some ways uh, uh, the best candidate to be the central feature of uh, these parties. And, and indeed, the studies do show that the, uh, uh, you know, if you look at sort of uh, what set of attitudes are most uh, commonly and strongly associated with support for populist right parties, then uh, anti-immigration sentiment is uh, the attitude that comes out uh, most strongly in those uh, estimations. Now, but what, uh, but what that is exactly and where it comes from is, I think, still something of a puzzle for us. Um, uh, and there seem to be a number of different things going on. I, I, again, I'll, try, I'll be brief, but let me just say uh, something about that. Um, so to some extent, uh, this uh, seems to be a genuine response to rising rates of immigration, uh, which has been a dimension of globalization. And um, in some ways, that's why I think globalization is, is such a, a powerful trope for uh, the radical right, uh, because it has multiple dimensions, and uh, they can be seen as a negative. Uh, so in a country like Germany, and I think also in Italy, if we think about the last election, it, I think there's no doubt that a, ri a concern about rising rates of immigration uh, plays a role in support for the populist right parties. Uh, on the other hand, as I'm sure you know, if you were to look across the regions of Europe and uh, look for an association between the number of immigrants in that region and a right populist support, you would find no association. In fact, it's the areas of the UK with the largest numbers of immigrants who were most likely to vote to remain in the uh, European Union. And of course, we, you can see why that would be the case. There's a way in which um, uh, familiarity uh, shifts people's views about um, the other. So the fear of immigration in Europe is strongest in the regions and the localities with the fewest immigrants. There's a way in which immigration is a specter uh, associated uh, with a certain kind of fear. And so that suggests that in addition to this one kind of channel, which has to do with a, a direct response to um, contact with uh, rising rates of immigration, uh, there may well be something else going on which has to do with the way in which uh, 
uh, as uh, many psychologists would argue, uh, 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 increasing economic insecurity uh, tends to generate resentment against outgroups. It tends to lead people to look for outgroups. Um, people of other races and religions and immigrants are the natural candidates for that. And of course, this is exploited by populist right parties, and so there's a kind of endogenous effect in which, um, uh, you know, if you look back at British electoral surveys, you'll find lots of anti-immigrant sentiment among the, the ordinary British working class people in, into the early 60s, which is the earliest we have these surveys for. So there, there is also an element of this being activated. So yes, I think you're right, and I think that it, there are some really interesting dynamics we're only beginning to understand there. If I could just abuse the position of the chair for a moment uh, and ask Peter as, as, as a follow-up to that. In discussing populism as an issue about the relationship between... Uh, uh, can, can you, are you, is your mic on? Can people hear? I think my mic is on. Maybe my oh, yeah. mic is not close enough to my mouth. Uh, <laughs> In discussing populism as involving a relationship uh, of critique against uh, elites, uh, the role of immigrants and immigration uh, uh, is, as, if I understand it, as an unaddressed problem as to which the political elites have been corrupt or incompetent, uh, rather than the immigrants themselves uh, being viewed. Uh, as the elites against which the populist charge is uh, directed, uh, or am I, am I not understanding? How, how should that be thought about? Um, my reading of the evidence, which is, I haven't contributed to this, but I've read a fair bit of it, it would be, no, no the, the, I hate to break it to you, but the um, resentment of immigrants is a resentment of immigrants, not just a resentment of elites for allowing in immigrants. Um, you know, there, there are, uh, strongly prejudicial views. Uh, I, I, there's probably a little bit of both, right? But, but um, in the surveys that I look at, uh, it's people who talk about not wanting to have uh, a Muslim as a neighbor or uh, 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 not thinking that there should be any more um, uh, dis religious displays and the like who are the are, are most likely to be strong supporters of populist right parties. So I think that um, it, uh, it, 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 in some ways it would be much easier to deal with if this were ultimately a critique of the immigration policies of elites. I will say uh, for, this, for this group, the human rights group, that, that I think that this issue, the centrality of the immigration issue here, certainly in uh, the developed democracies I look at, poses in some ways the most fundamental political dilemma uh, for uh, those who are committed to human rights and uh, political uh, progressives in particular. Um, how should they be responding? Should, uh, uh, should progressive center-left parties uh, be responding to very significant levels of um, uh, concern about immigration uh, by cutting back on immigration? And, uh, and, and I think the issues become even more uh, difficult when we think it's not just a matter of uh, uh, closing the borders, it's also a matter of how you treat religious minorities inside uh, countries like France or Germany or Austria, for instance. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are serious issues there which I think uh, uh, can't be uh, totally resolved by simply saying, well, of course, we have to defend the cosmopolitan values and the human rights values uh, that we think uh, are uh, the most important in the world. Uh, because there's a possibility that if you do that, uh, you won't be on the political scene anymore and there won't be anybody to defend those values. So it is a genuine dilemma as opposed to something easily resolved. Just yes, I'd just like to clarify that what I meant to be asking was not about the social phenomenon, but about the understanding of populism and to the extent in which elites are treated as a key element in the definition of populism. Oh, I see. Yes, well, you're identifying right. The popu right. The, identifying the elites, yes. it's, the, it's the incumbent elites who are not dealing with the immigrants who are seen as the problem. That's, the, that's how that maps onto that definition of populism. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah.
Uh, sorry, Michael, Reverend Slaughter. Uh, sorry for the clarity in my phrasing of the question. No, no Michael let's, Posner. Let's take more questions. Hi, uh, yeah, Mike Posner from NYU. Um, Peter, I, you, when you spoke um, initially, you talked about demand side and supply side. And on the demand side, one of the things you said, at least uh, this is what I heard, is a big part or an, an element in addition to the anti-immigrant and you know, uh, issues you just described, a big part is that there are a significant number of people who are economically uh, in trouble and they're anxious about their own personal situation. And then you said on the supply side, liberal democratic parties or liberal left parties have in a sense seeded the ground on that discussion and are talking about values. Um, and that's worked to their disadvantage. I'm interested in knowing, are there, in, in any countries you've looked at, are there examples of where center-left parties have taken on the economic issues and rather than just saying, we're sorry about it, come up with an affirmative agenda that says, here's how we would deal with it, which is better than the other side. To what extent is any, in any situation have you seen a successful response to that uh, phenomenon? I can't, I can't think of great success stories. It's a, great, it's a very good question. I should have an answer for you that I don't have. I, I will say that I think um, uh, it's not as if uh, there's, uh, there are no differences between center left and center right in these countries, including in the US, as Matt said. Um, uh, uh, um, but those differences in recent decades have had to do mainly with levels of social benefits. And if we took a kind of, uh, the view that many uh, conventional economists take of populism, or some economists take of populism, which is that it's a revolt against globalization, and the uh, root cause was a failure to compensate the losers uh, in the context of free trade agreements, uh, and so in some sense compensating the losers is, the economic losers is the uh, solution to this, um, if that means social benefits, then I think that that's a misdiagnosis. Uh, you have to decide whether you see this as a response to your question or just me rabbiting on. But um, because it's not, I don't think it's social benefits that these people mainly want. And I don't think that's at the root cause of the problem. I think the root cause of the problem is uh, what I call decent jobs a capacity to have a job that pays well enough and has enough security uh, that you can support a family comfortably on it and you can look forward with a certain amount of optimism towards your future. And, and the reason I'm emphasizing this and, and why I think it's germane to your question is um, if we could solve this with more social benefits, uh, this political problem could be solved. But all you have to do is look at France, which has uh, you know, uh, more than 50% of GDP uh, runs through government revenue, and there are very significant social benefits. Or look at uh, Denmark or Sweden, where there are also very generous welfare states, but there are also significant populist right parties. It's clear that social benefits, redistribution of the sort the center left has been willing to do, while desirable in itself, in my view, is not an answer to this problem. And that is a real a challenge because if the problem is to create decent jobs in the context of a dramatically changing economy, uh, uh, so for that, that's why I think, I guess to take it back to why this is an answer, a response anyway to your question, that's why I think I can't think of center left governments that have effectively responded uh, to this issue because it is so difficult to address. Can I maybe? a couple of quick, of quick additions to that. I'm not sure I would necessarily be quite as pessimistic um, insofar as one could view those countries where the right-wing populace haven't taken over as countries where the center-left or perhaps center-right has been successful by virtue of the fact that they've designed a package of policies that keeps enough people happy given their, their electoral system that the insurgent populace haven't taken over. Um, so, again, I think it's, it depends on exactly what you're asking. If you're asking places where the populace have taken over and then been beaten back, that's one thing. But again, there it's a fairly recent phenomenon. If the, if, if the question is, are there countries 
where the populists haven't been able to get a foothold and take over in the first place, arguably because the political elite has done a good enough job in keeping enough people happy, then I think yeah, we got a lot of examples of that, right? But that's, that's the optimistic. The pessimistic bit of this actually comes out of, out of Peter's paper, so he could have said it too, but since he didn't, I think it's a point that he makes that's a really good one that's worth making. Um, in many areas of politics, we talk about kind of absolute welfare, but then also relative or positional welfare. And the former, uh, in the former case, you can get win-win. You don't always, right? Sometimes we don't compensate the losers and that's bad, but at least with respect to globalization, the economists would say it would be possible with the right package of policies to have globalization, free trade, and so forth, and make everybody better off or at least no worse off, because if you're increasing net social wealth, if you do the right thing and you have the right kind of redistribution, you can solve that problem. But if what's going on is a positional issue, then everybody could be getting better off in an absolute sense, but certain people or groups are worse off in a relative or positional sense, and they're still going to be mad. So it was really, I thought it was really great about Peter's paper and the graph that he showed is when people in different demographic groups were asked to you know, say where they were on the social status ladder. It's not clear exactly from the way the question is phrased whether it's meant to be a, a relative or an absolute amount, but my conjecture is that most people interpret it, at least implicitly, as relative. So they're thinking like, relative to where I was or where I think I should be, this is where I am. And that's harder because that's kind of zero sum. You can't raise the status of, the, the relative status of women and marginalized groups, to go back to the previous question, other groups, without decreasing the relative status of traditionally privileged groups. It, and if you believe, as some people do, that people tend to fight harder in, about keeping what they have or get angrier if they feel like they're losing what they have, then the people on the opposite side are made happy by getting something they didn't have, then this might create a kind of political, a psychological political asymmetry. Um, and so I would say the optimistic me says, hey, actually most of the liberal, de liberal democracies in the Western world have beaten back the populist onslaught so far. But then the pessimist in me says, yeah, but if we want all these things that I think a lot of us in this group want, which is more equality and more opportunity and, and, and greater uh, solicitude for the interests of marginalized groups, that will inevitably threaten the relative position of traditionally privileged groups, and they're going to get angry about it. And it's not clear there's anything we can do about that at that level. If, so if I, I could, totally yeah. go ahead, Ruth. I was just going to say, because I, I, I'd love to hear what you have to say, because I think that Matt's correct, um, plus one more thing, and that is the values group. Right? Because no matter how much you improve absolute welfare, if the issue that's driving is values related, we're not going to appease those sorts of, um, um, I think, considerations. But it's also why I say in my paper that I'm two things. One, I'm really concerned, first, that the attack on globalization masks what we are not doing in the United States with respect to social, economic, and collective rights. Um, access to education, just basic access to a decent job. We have not invested in the structural conditions that would make it possible for future generations to have the expectations that our, our generation had, perhaps in lesser quality, but and the previous generations have. And the expectation that we should be doing better is the expectation every American has. Right? This is sort of the, the heart of the American dream. And when people think that their progress is stalled, even if they're better off than they were yesterday, if they're not as well off as they think they ought to be, there will be resentment. And we've got to deal with that values piece of this and deal with the reality that if you got rid of globalization, um, it would become very evident that the real culprit is our own um, failure to have invested in the kinds of conditions that make economic well-being um, available, available and um, expected for every citizen. And there's Please. time to say something. So I entirely agree, agree with what you just said, uh, Ruth. And Matt, I'm extremely glad you said what you said, because I entirely disagree with it. OK, great. Um, uh, <laughs> So you're, the, the, in, in principle, the point is well taken. We should be thinking about positional goods and, and th this issue of relative versus absolute well-being. I, I think your, um, your motivation is much to be admired. Uh, and, the, and the substance I entirely disagree with, because I think that um, 
I, there's no reason why, uh, well, so, uh, in a, some years ago I tried to draw, I, I won't take time to try and explain how, uh, graphs of the status hierarchy in various uh, Western societies. So, you know, um, uh, uh, it, and, and they can, it can be more steep, that is say people at the bottom of the hierarchy, which uh, basically this is use, taking income deciles and looking at uh, the status people assign themselves, uh, the average status in those deciles. So as you might expect in the US, the status hierarchy is relatively steep. But as you might expect, the status hierarchy in Sweden is relatively flat, right? The status hierarchy proved to be steeper. These, they're, they're, you can, these measures were not perfect, but in, broadly speaking, the status hierarchy was steeper in uh, Germany. Uh, there was a, a, but the status hierarchy in Germany, if it was as steep as the U.S., everybody in Germany thought of themselves as having higher status than uh, everybody in the U.S. sort of thing. I, you know, I, I don't have those figures here. So my point is that, um, Yes, uh, we can think of status um, in the same way that we can think of income as uh, being on a, a distribution, and there are going to be people who are at the bottom and there are going to be people at the top, uh, but those distributions can nonetheless be, broadly speaking, more equal or less equal. And, uh, and I think that while you, we could have a longer debate about this, and I'm trying to produce a little bit of spark to the end, the, end the panel, um, and I would ultimately concede that um, People do, there's evidence that people care about their relative position, but there is some empirical evidence, as you know, for that. Um, broadly speaking, though, I think that uh, um, it, 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 you can improve the situation of the middle and even the bottom without necessarily making uh, so many people at the top feel like uh, they're the real losers from this. And, and more importantly, I think you can improve the situation of people at the bottom without making people in the middle uh, feel that they are necessarily losers, uh, precisely because this distribution of status um, uh, uh, is uh, variable. I put that very well. But. Uh, I would be thrilled to be wrong about that. Um, so, you know, I hope you're right. Okay. Well, we are now at a point of reaching a zero-sum game between discussion and coffee, and I think coffee should win. Uh, so please join me uh, in thanking the panelists. Discussion will continue after coffee. That was fun.